you can see um, if we have to understand this area of uh, counterfeiting, we definitely have a module on the uh, automotive part in this uh, right. So, we have a large module on automotive um, uh, this one IOT and uh, we did discuss about air fuel mixture ratio and all that which essentially improves the performance of the engine, fuel efficiency and so on and so forth. What happens if you have a counterfeit of that ok, supposing you have a, a, a throttle body which uh, is a counterfeit of the original one and or throttle body along with the ECU because the ECU is the one that is ultimately uh, you know giving command to the throttle body to do a few things that is opening the uh, no energizing the motor to open the butterfly valve and all that. So, the ECU if I clone I will have my own uh, system and I can you know sort of uh, essentially uh, take control of the complete car uh, right. So, such vulnerabilities have been identified uh, way back in 2014 on very famous uh, you know well branded uh, vehicles. Uh, I will point you to an article here which appeared in the IEEE spectrum. You can see that uh, if I can perhaps even enhance it new more it may be useful. So, let me see I will go uh, 400 percent no that was too much. So, maybe 200 percent or maybe 250 percent let me try so that yes I think this is good right. So, you can download this article anytime. Uh, which appeared. So, so here is the issue. If you uh, change the air fuel mixture, right? This is on a Honda car. This uh, happened in February 2014, and uh, they were selling a cloned version of a Honda Ta S300. This is a plug-in module for engine computer, essentially an ECU that reads data from sensors, and uh, it's modifying air fuel mixture idling speed other factors all that uh, it is it can have access to moment you have a cloned hardware right. So, this is uh, very close to a genuine product and um, um, so can be leading to very dangerous uh, situations and it could open door to malicious hardware and critical failures of the complete uh, system. So, one may have to uh, let me put it to a little lower so that you get a full picture. So, you see here is a picture of one is fake the other is real hardly you can make out if I put it on screen here you do not know which is fake and which is uh, real right. So, quite straight forward it is just not only about automotive parts that one have to be worried about it is also about the IOT devices the data that they generate and uh, the network to which they inject they basically communicate to networks and uh, the, there are network routers which are there. As you know that when we talk about IOT devices they all have end IPv6 addresses right and uh, they are uh, sensing something and or perhaps they have some actuation also which they are connected to and they are giving out data. And then there are these routers uh, of different uh, which are essentially connecting uh, several subnets and uh, these routers are uh, critical to get the data to the right uh, aggregating point where commands have to be issued. Uh, so, if the router gets compromised again data from these sensors is going in a different direction is going to is being uh, directed to a different spot. So, it is also about network routers uh, which uh, essentially are can be popular targets for cloning and see the point really is that if you want to clone um, it should make sense to the person who is trying to clone. If he invests a very small amount of time and has a huge impact on uh, cloning it it is worth cloning, but if you have to do a lot of sophistication to clone it. I think most people will just give it up right. You want to do all that uh, sophistication in cloning uh, you know reading layer by layer of a chip and all that 
only if it is going to give you billions and billions of dollars uh, much more than your in, your high investments. So, that is the point return on investment in time in money uh, is what cloners also will examine very carefully and only then they will try. So, it is not for for fun or for anything that people want to do, but really they want to disrupt the proper working of the system uh, because there is some gain in the in the process. So, this is another thing. So, you really do not know whether you are buying a cloned uh, hardware or an unclo or a genuine one. This is also with respect to very famous uh, networking companies like Cisco systems where gigabit converters cloned ones were trying to be sold to defense uh, departments. So, it is more uh, sometimes um, there are also people who may want to do it for uh, greed rather than to do any harm just because they can make a fast buck by selling off a uh, cloned hardware at uh, which they buy at uh, some throwaway price. They are basically middle people they are not the ones who actually clone they are people who buy and they want to sell this knowing fully well that it is a cloned hardware that is the point. So, those people are only after it is only greed. So, the whole uh, uh, ecosystem of uh, uh, cloning and counterfeiting is quite large different players doing different things. So, this particular uh, Cisco systems gigabit interface which was uh, sold to uh, US Department of Defense is uh, was more from greed rather than to do any harm particularly by this person. Okay. So, unlike counterfeit electronics of the past today's attacks are uh, much more uh, much more sophisticated. So, this is really the point of this uh, further things that you talk about those include um, you know you are uh, essentially looking at just not going beyond uh, you know remarking and repackaging of inferior components you go into manufacture of their own components. You manufacture components, you manufacture boards, you manufacture systems from scratch and then package them uh, into superficially similar products. So, it is just not simple game of uh, just making something, but in fact going into much more sophistication. So, these clones may be less reliable than the genuine product and uh, they undergo some rigorous because they do not undergo any rigorous testing. Uh, but they are all that they may also host unwanted or um, or even malicious software firmware and all that. So, uh, buyer who knows nothing about what is actually happening simply takes it and uh, does not know whether it is a really a clone product or or something else. Now, once uh, you install the cloned hardware you can do a lot of interesting things right you can do man in the middle attacks and uh, you can secretly establish uh, uh, you know secure communication between two systems bypass security mechanisms uh, integrity um, verification all of that you can do and you can um, you know you can bypass all of them and uh, so the software that is hidden in a router could allow an uh, attacker to take control of other systems on the network rerouting as i mentioned um, so many things uh, once you get access to the uh, once you have your own hardware installed there which looks exactly like the original one and uh, sold it off to an unsuspecting uh, customer several things happen. So, a cloner who succeed in embedding malicious software or hardware into a combat drone for instance can shut down or retarget um, it when it reaches its uh, GPS location. So, all kinds of issues can happen. Okay. Uh, cloning is not just limited to very low levels it can be at you can do it at different levels. This article further says you can do cloning a PCB uh, which is pretty straightforward and uh, essentially it is an integrated package of electronics and obtaining details of embedded firmware manufacturing and all that. So, it essentially means that uh, why if you look at lot of things that are available in open source right. Uh, you have schematics in open source, you have Gerber files of PCBs in open source, you can just take them by your own components put them together and so hardware cloning is pretty straightforward particularly open source has given you that ability to replicate hardware even very sophisticated uh, uh, systems are out there in open source. For example, if you want a open source uh, radio platform 
uh, that schematic is available components are available and uh, they give you some location where you can um, uh, get the uh, boot software and uh, you can install it and make your own uh, systems and all that all in good faith all in time terms of trying to support open free soft open source software and getting things free cheap uh, to for the betterment of humanity. But there is just 1 or 2 percent or even at even lesser percent of people who actually take this into account and then they turn it around and say let me do something bad by all that is available freely out on the internet. So, this is really the issue here. So, you not only look at uh, PCB, but you can also go to the chip level. Okay. So, you can also clone a chip supposing there is an IP on a chip and that is a chip that does a lot of wonders. Uh, for instance, um, in today's world I can imagine that if you are designing a for an automotive application you are designing a radar chip, okay, radar on chip. Uh, so, the whole chip is a very and that is working at a very high frequency right. So, you are looking at uh, the ISM band in the millimeter wave uh, frequencies particularly automotive you talk about uh, I think it is in the 60 to 77, um, 77 megahertz, uh, gigahertz range. So, that frequency at that frequency uh, you have a nice electronic chip and if you are able to clone it uh, you can make billions and billions because every car today every vehicle today will have a radar on board right because uh, you are looking at safety measures and so on. So, it is worth it if you want to try uh, looking at those high value um, and uh, billions of components which are made. So, people may want to look at uh, those issues. So, to do you are looking at billion transistor versions chip becomes attractive for cloners right and uh, that can happen when a manufacturer stops producing a particular chip and thus forcing everyone who wants to use the discounted chip to buy uh, through some uh, distribute some lower version of the chip is available um, and then there is a case here which says about uh, as time goes on the chip will uh, become scarce okay, because uh, the manufacturer has stopped producing it and uh, there is a discounted uh, chip which is available at 72 dollars and still manufactured one is at 52 dollars. Okay. So, Essentially, uh, as the price of the discounted chip continues to climb, uh, this uh, the cloners may be willing to make the investment in reverse engineering, and then start producing that chip because it's in high demand. So they may want to continue producing it. So all kinds of issues can happen from a market perspective. Nobody really knows the true scale of electronics clo cloning. Uh, because these are all uh, done by less than 1 percent or I would not even 1 percent I think it is a very very small 0.1 or 0.2 percent of people who really look at uh, the uh, uh, you know this kind of clandestine nature of activity. Um, so, that is what this paper is actually saying. Now, uh, let us move on. Uh, so, I am sure you are getting a feel of where uh, uh, the cloners are coming from and uh, you will also see that uh, they do all kinds of things they copy a design and uh, they fabricate the product that is simple to do. They may do sophisticated things like uh, they uh, may do uh, imaging uh, of a chip they do Im uh, they use imaging instruments and analysis tools and so on. They use optical microscopes and they can produce 3D images and um, they may do chemical etching uh, which uh, by which they can do layer by layer and so on. So, you can use uh, uh, techniques like high end microscopes and x-ray machines uh, and do go, go and uh, actually get to uh, you know get a picture of the chip that is of interest. All right. So, as I mentioned the chemical etching and all that is another uh, possibility. So, um, the cloner can copy it during uh, um, so on most so let me just read the sentence on most PCBs the system software is stored in non volatile memory. You can the cloner can simply copy the software by tapping into the data bus and uh, when the processing unit loads system instructions from the non volatile storage into active memory 
um, or the cloner can directly look into the memory. See these are very sophisticated techniques. You can read off the memory locations and you can get to the key. Okay, you can use microscope or infrared backside imaging. Uh, the la the infra the uh, infrared backside imaging has an advantage that semiconductor materials are transparent to certain wavelengths, right? And uh, under powerful microscope, the cloner can actually see the stored ones and zeros, and and reconstruct the code. So you can see that so much of sophistication is applied. Um, if if it really makes financial sense to the cloner to uh, get to that point now how do you fight back okay so that's really the issue see one thing that you can do is um, um, you know it isn't easy that is for sure uh, so you can say fighting back against the cloners isn't easy given that the wide variety of electronic products that are there um, the ma to date the main defense has been supply chain security okay essentially you do something uh, giving uh, each chip a PCB product unique some ID you put and you start tracking that ID. But the problem with this ID based uh, system is and uh, see all these uh, things that is each chip PCB or uh, product identification ID and all that um, is uh, part of the supply chain and it is in some database right it is stored in some database. Cloner has very easy access to the database. So, he can simply go to the database and pull out this information and start using it on whatever he has cloned. So, cloners can simply access databases copy ID numbers and then place them on their counterfeit goods. So, it is very simple this is not this is what is currently happening. So, it is not going to work really okay. Now, here is a nice solution to this problem. Um, pretty uh, expensive solution though, but I would say it is a novel thought that how do you get out get out of this counterfeiting uh, issue. So, you can it is just an introduction because we do not have I do not have any lab setups to show you what the solution is, but I am also excited to say that this is what you should be doing if you want to move forward with uh, the two problems that I mentioned to you. Um, uh, related to device uh, the hardware device part which essentially spans the um, device uh, identification I mentioned to you. So, let me open that back so that so the two problems I mentioned to you which are of interest to us is related to identity and uh, of course, uh, tamper open install close as we said and you look at all these things uh, you get back a nice uh, possible what can you do if you have such a very rich uh, amount of hardware sitting on a small uh, embedded device. So, let us move on to see what you can do. What uh, this article is saying is that uh, you can tag chips and circuit boards with special materials. So, materials engineering has become a, taken a forefront essentially you look at plant DNA. So, I would urge you to look at plant DNA and then you start fighting the cloners um, by, uh, by you take, take clone fighters take botanical um, DNA sequences and scramble them creating a unique pattern that can be used as a signature for a batch of electronic parts. They then mix this DNA with selected uh, fluorophores which are chemicals that glow under specific wavelengths of light and tag the electronics with the with this uh, DNA ink. Now, purchasers trying to confirm whether the chip is authentic will scan it for the fluorescent uh, signature. If it is missing, it is a sure indication that something is wrong. Uh, if the fluorescent mark exists, the purchaser will swab the spot to pull out pull a sample of the DNA and then send it to a lab. Standard forensic DNA techniques are used to identify the plant sequences which is checked which get checked against the products database to confirm whether the label and the part matches. So, important so important that you got to do it at multiple levels in order to know that yes this is what I got and um, this is indeed the genuine part that I have. Imagine um, important parts okay, landing gear for instance of a plane if it gets uh, if you get a 
cloned uh, landing gear you are uh, you are in serious trouble right the aircraft manufacturer is in serious trouble even the if, if he uses uh, these kind most often they are manufactured locally they are manufactured within the company but critical parts um, may also sometimes be ma ma manufactured uh, not necessarily in the same uh, uh, factory okay there could be an integration place where is there is a assembly of all the parts and the part itself could be manufactured by the company in a different location during transit something can happen okay do when it is being brought to the place of assembly something can get swapped so these issues will have to be borne in mind and it's possible that you will have this uh, you will have to somehow solve this so this dna uh, methods are appearing to be very very attractive so let's move on because it is indeed something that i want you to urge and look up um, as we go along to solve this major problem so in summary if the fluorescent mark exists the purchaser will swab the uh, spot to pull a sample of the dna and then send it to a lab and then you do some dna techniques forensic dna techniques you identify the plant sequences you get check it against the products database and confirm whether the label and the part uh, matches so this is how you would exactly say that it is genuine one of the companies that uh, it's not far off right so this is already there in practice uh, dna authentication dna tagging is pretty much clone proof that's what they say because the dna sequence data is held in a database that is accessible only to uh, laboratory staff unlike the open databases used for traditional parts ids still i would say this is a you know sort of a risky affair if this uh, database uh, which is held in the lab gets compromised uh, then you are again in 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 little bit of a trouble but what can you do this is the best that you can think of today cloners also don't have access to essential element of dna tagging uh, process uh, the primer uh, required to start the chain of dna formation so primers are small custom built sequences of dna to which other specific uh, sequences of dna attach they basically help dna sequencing tools find the start of the dna chain so this tagging process is not available with cloners so therefore for cloners to do something with dna tagging is not going to be easy but there are problems with dna uh, tagging as well it's very expensive um it's a something around the range of 250 dollars but they expect that it will come down and uh, see that uh, the test equipment that could be used uh, at a parts purchases location um, can be there right there so you don't have to take it to labs and do all the testing and all that so these issues are still there but i think it's making good progress this is one part of the story the other part of the story is okay if you don't have dna matching and all that uh, sophistication built in is there anything which can trigger from um from this picture is the question okay from this picture what can be triggered it turns out that you can do a lot already if you have a system like this and generate what is known as a physically unclonable function it's called puf and puffs are well known they have not taken off but they are a cheap good replacement for solving this problem of uh, device identity at least for sure um, you if you do any replacement of any sub system of this you should be able to do an identity tampering okay that's another thing you can do it differently but uh, directly a puff may not uh, um, uh, you know try to tell you anything with respect to uh, tamper um, because um, that is essentially opening a product installing something and closing if the installation is a hardware uh, installation then puff can directly pitch in right hardware uh, pitch, uh, installation but if it is a software installation what you can only do is you must be able to detect that uh, the system was uh, being opened and then you could perhaps um, um, you know only flag that part 
So, I would say identity is something for sure you will be able to uh, avoid and therefore, counterfeiting is something that can come very strongly into uh, this product. So, let us see what this article further says about physically unclonable uh, functions. Now, um, so we looked at that all right. So, the latest uh, promising countermeasure against electronic cloning is something called the puff. Now, what it essentially means is potentially puff physically unclonable function it can protect chips, it can protect the PCB even high level products like routers and all that. Essentially puff will give each chip a unique fingerprint. So, it is essentially about fingerprinting and they rely on the physical variations among transistors or other components on a chip like the width of metal traces which in turn cause subtle differences in behavior. Okay. So, what this means is it is very profound statement to make that if you buy a chip silicon chip the process variation from chip to chip is so high that you should be able to pull out some sort of a signature some sort of fingerprinting from that chip. This is in essence what the physically unclonable function is trying to say that is I should be able to identify uniquely uh, between two controllers that this controller is different from that although they look identical they are manufactured in the same assembly line they are in the same manufacturing process because of the process variations you can have uh, you can have different uh, signatures you can generate signatures you can generate a fingerprint of the chip just because of process variation in the process manufacturing process variation. Okay, so, let me read it again they rely on the physical variations among transistors or other components on a chip like the width of metal traces which in turn cause subtle differences in behavior small differences are there in behavior and uh, this is essentially what you may want to use. So, puff designers will look for this variation right and um, it could be in terms of switching speed of different transistors um, manifesting itself in switching speed right. So, when many, tra many transistors are combined into a circuit because a chip comprises of billions of transistors right the differences in their switching speeds affect the signal propagation along a specific path which can be measured and compared with the signal propagations of another supposedly identical path on the same uh, chip right. So, this is uh, the key from the two paths the manufacturer can create a one bit signature for the chip. Okay. Now, he gives an example if the switching speeds are faster along first path uh, than the second one the manufacturer can assign uh, the bit as 1. Uh, so, then you create a longer signature say 16 or 64 bits it typically compares uh, more paths. So, essentially you are looking at this sentence when many transistors are combined into a circuit the differences in their switching speeds affect the signal propagation along a specific path which can be measured and compared with the signal propagation of another uh, supposedly identical path on the same chip supposedly the identical path you make a comparison you will get some one bit signature you compare with many many paths then you will get um, you can get a longer signature 16 or 64 bits. So, essentially the this whole uh, module on security is related to puffs and I took this long to arrive at this point. Okay. So, please concentrate on this uh, hot topic um, and try to look up as much literature as possible on the area of physically unclonable functions which are essentially generated due to process variations which manifests itself in terms of uh, what we just read about uh, signal paths timing related delays that are there between different paths all that is happening because of the process uh, variation which is indeed the cause of the problem. Okay. Now, puffs paths must be designed into the chip either making use of existing features um, and uh, you must have a way of 
measuring it right. So, you must have test circuits or embedded memory or you should build some embedded circuitry which make, make, makes a measurement of this uh, uh, this uh, you know path delays right. So, you must you need a circuitry. So, you essentially should make one more chip which again can have uh, its own uh, variation, but it has the ability to measure this uh, variations in the existing chips and then uh, either you make a chip or you make an additional circuitry and you have to embed that circuitry. That is the penalty you pay you build something you want to make it secure you want to extract something in terms of hardware signature uh, from the actual uh, device because you want to uniquely identify it then the circuitry will be required that is perhaps a problem. Uh, you may say that oh how will I put that additional circuitry, but that indeed has a lot of value in uh, making into getting to PUF right. Once a batch of chips uh, is manufactured the chip meter checks how the puff structures on each chip respond to specific inputs uh, generated by external or internal test circuitry and then registers the chips unique signature in a database. Manufacturer can also do this test and put it into a database. Now, a customer can query the database to see if a chip at any phase in the supply chain is authentic or fake. Uh, in much the same way a database containing biometric fingerprints can be checked all right. So, this is still taking help from the manufacturer because puff uh, fingerprints are determined during manufacturing process they are extremely difficult to replicate. But uh, the question really is uh, why would the manufacturer want to maintain uh, such a database for every chip that uh, he or she manufactures in the assembly line it is not going to be a scalable solution right it is it is not going to work. So, I think whoever is trying to use those chips into their systems they will have to take up the responsibility of um, adding that additional circuitry externally perhaps and then make a measurement themselves and create a private database of all the um, you know uh, the modules electronic embedded modules that they are likely to use in their uh, installation. So, that I think would be a better approach than perhaps asking the manufacturer because he is going to manufacture billions to cut costs and to uh, you know put down price of each uh, uh, component. So, it is not going to work if you have to ask the manufacturer to generate this all right. So, um, because puff uh, fingerprints are determined during manufacturing they are all difficult and all that. The first uh, is is uh, is you know that the tiny variations in in transistors that underlie the chips digital signature can fluctuate um, along with uh, voltage or uh, ambient temperature and uh, as the transistor ages its switching speed can uh, slow down. See now problems are coming slowly from manufacturing um, there is some way by which uh, you can perhaps uh, the manufacturer can generate it and put it into a database right. But that is not going to be the final one because what happens is uh, the end use end application of the chip could be in high temperature end application of the chip could be in some other uh, harsh condition very low temperatures for, for instance. Now, will the signature be the same across variations in temperature that is one aspect will the signature remain what it is for all possible voltages that are applied to the chip because chips essentially if you take controllers they can work from 1.8 volts to 3.6 volts right or even lower also sometimes. So, uh, what is the nature of the signature uh, when uh, the voltage is uh, varied uh, will this uh, delay uh, you know increase or decrease or so will that signature actually vary at all. So, how does the process uh, essentially we are asking how does the process variation affect get affected by change in voltages and change in variation in voltages and variation in temperatures. This is the reason perhaps that manufacturers may not want to really keep a database because it is going to be very fluidic. Uh, also as the time progresses age progresses this can also change. So, that is another problem of uh, switching speeds getting slower as the system uh, go goes down. So, that is a problem with puffs. 
there is another problem uh, which I already mentioned to you that uh, manufacturers have to include a circuitry or even another chip perhaps. So, adding this additional circuitry is another problem uh, which essentially says um, puff technologies that rely on existing chip components such as embedded memory or test structures to generate the signatures will add little or no cost to the design right. A final problem um, is that cloners could use uh, uh, some form of modeling. So, it is not that once you generate uh, let us say a unique signature across temperature variations, across voltage variations and store it in your private database. Uh, and put in that complicated circuitry to do a measurement all that or even embed that circuitry on the embedded system itself put that circuitry on the chip all that is fine. But then uh, you can apply uh, hackers cloners uh, you know they go any distance right we also said they do chemical etching to see layer by layer what is happening looking at uh, microscopes to look at bits in the memory all that we have seen in this article. Um, so, they can go any length any distance to uh, clone the hardware. So, um, the, the cloner can also use uh, uh, I would say reasonably sophisticated uh, statistical techniques to generate back the uh, behavior of these puffs. So, you can see behavior of puffs through some statistical modeling is another possibility. And researchers have demonstrated that signatures from some puffs technologies are not as random as initially thought. So, it is really possible that um, several uh, signatures that appeared at, uh, part at the time when the chip was manufactured under room conditions under certain voltage conditions just vanished moment temperatures changed and at the moment the voltage is changed. So, you may not have too much too many invariant uh, kind of signatures that you can extract from. So, that is uh, one major issue with puff, but nevertheless it is still attractive for you to try ok. But what people uh, researchers have tried is ok you have some problem with respect to the chip itself and uh, the uh, signature the puff signature that you can extract from the chip. But what if this chip is sitting on a PCB and you extend the variability um, of whatever is happening within the chip to the board level here is what people have said. Researchers have been extending the concept of uh, concept to PCB in this case they use random variations inside the chips that go on to the PCB as well as variations in the metal traces that connect them. So, if you can extend that uh, it becomes a very exciting uh, possibility. Um, uh, which is unlike uh, chip uh, fingerprints which manufacturers may not want to do. PCB fingerprints can be checked remotely to verify the authenticity of a piece of equipment. So, this technique could be used for example, to ensure that critical infrastructure components once installed are not later replaced with clones. So, this is really what um, could be the way out uh, when you go away from um, chip based uh, fingerprinting to uh, system level uh, fingerprinting where PCB fingerprints can be used. And also companies like Microsemi, Xilinx they have started using puffs for uh, chip uh, identification although they have been using it they this would be a much more uh, a practical manner to look at it from a PCB fingerprint perspective. Now, research on advanced methods. Okay, so, government and industry will have to do a lot more and uh, this last sentence is absolutely critical. You see that the number of devices are growing everyone sees the dangers of cloned uh, products. Um, estimates are that IOT population could reach 30 billion by 2020. Um, just imagine that 1 percent of these connected devices where clones harboring malicious hardware or software that would mean potential army that is 300 million strong waiting for the opportunity to launch an attack of the clones ok. So, um, so it is really a exciting area at the same time you may want to consider security from the puff perspective. And you can see that this article is not very old it is appeared in 2017 
and I urge you to read this article and uh, contemplate on um, the invasion of hardware as a possible way to extract uh, signatures um, which goes beyond the uh, well known CPS uh, techniques. Now let us move on to take one use case of um, how a sort of a gateway device um, was hacked into uh, because um, certain things were open and how the, the step by step process with which uh, one could get access to if you leave uh, an embedded system open to certain vulnerabilities. Again I am telling you this is not a, a CPS vulnerability I am we are not looking at that we are looking at devices gateway devices that you can physically see uh, and you may want to do some sort of um, reversing on the reverse engineering on the existing not, not so much from a product reverse engineering but access to the device okay, and then essentially tampering the device that is the second part which is essentially doing a open and then you uh, do a replace and then you close something back right. Let me take your attention to um, this paper which essentially is uh, uh, talking about security analysis on consumer and industrial IoT devices. This is also recently published article and um, this initial part is all about the IoT devices uh, being introduced to the market. You will roughly have 2 devices per human that uh, demonstrates a staggering conclusion that uh, there are more connected uh, systems than people living uh, today. So, it is going to be a large 25, 30 billion devices um, which are going to appear right. Okay. So, primarily this, uh, this uh, work of the IoT device is to collect process and relay data through communication channel and sometimes control a much uh, larger uh, unit. So, we will see what exactly this security analysis of this uh, device is all about. Um, you can do it as I mentioned the software way right. If you do it the software way you want to bring in certain protection you can do it using uh, firmware signing for instance. You can do it through execution of uh, and the execution of signed binaries. Um, and these are methods which are very popular you can see there is so much of literature around um, that part. These solutions um, do, do not consider the different uh, usage pattern that IoT devices have when compared to traditional embedded systems. Uh, so, that is really a problem and if you have these software solutions you can actually do a bypass. Uh, you can do uh, bypass, but software level protections often leave the hardware um, unintentionally vulnerable. So, again the access is about is of all about hardware and it is uh, um, vulnerability that uh, you allow new attack vectors to come in and uh, vandalize tamper the device. So, let us see um, uh, so, so let us see step by step how a product uh, a gateway equivalent product. Uh, when I say gateway I mean slightly bigger uh, device right I am not talking about small embedded sensing uh, devices, but a slightly bigger product and uh, how that can be exploited and uh, tampered with. So, the device that we are looking at is this one. So, I will show you a picture this is that higher smart care uh, device. So, you can see this is the size of the device and uh, it is designed it is like a gateway it takes data from several sensors. Um, okay, and uh, you it's talking about uh, smoke. It's talking about water leakage, and it's like a hub, which essentially gets data from several uh, systems, including power, uh, power related. That is energy consumption in the home. So uh, idea is, if you have such a hub device at home, you will get alerts based on different information. Now the question is, how does one hack into this system? You can see this is the hardware. It runs Linux. Okay, 
and uh, it is based on ARM Cortex A8 and it has a, uh, it is a neon extension processor and all that. Um, and uh, we, and it, it has a UART interface ok. So, upon analyzing the data sheet for the processor by looking at the uh, C processor you know that it has a UART interface and uh, then you know that your first thing is ok let us see if I can hack into the use that UART interface and do a few things there alright. So, that is the first step in order for the users to connect to the device they must first download some mobile app that is all from an uh, from an applications perspective ok. Next they must connect the smart care to their network using ethernet connection and they must follow some procedure and all that right. But uh, from a person who wants to uh, you know tamper with it he is leveraging the he or she is leveraging the UART connection ok to, to read the uh, serial data. All right. Once you connect that, you are able to go to the U-boot shell. Okay, we are dropped into the U-boot shell. So you see, the first step is you are able to view its startup sequence, and then you know that it is going to the U-boot shell. Uh, it is here that you modify the boot parameters, and uh, you modify the initial shell uh, among other variables. Attackers will modify, gain low-level access to the device. After modifying the parameters, you again initiate the boot process. Uh, once the device has finished booting up you are dropped into a rudimentary shell. So, you make some changes to U-boot shell make the initial changes you get into this rudimentary shell. Once you have this rudimentary shell you look at permissions the running ID that is showed to us and looking through the busy box utility showed that the device is capable of um, running uh, some telnet and all that and uh, referencing the document you will see that they are able to deduce that uh, the device is running DES encryption ok on the password while uh, also not uh, using um, while not using a, a sort of you know it is basically is using a DES encryption. So, now the question is this means that the password is truncated to a maximum of 8 characters uh, you need to obtain the root password for the device and uh, the root password hash you have to crack into it. So, what you do? if you want the root password you do a dictionary attack. So, you will have 32 million uh, passwords you run through 32 million passwords and checked and uh, you see if you can get to the password. Uh, you have another option you can do a brute force attack as well and uh, although this is a large uh, key space and it may take hours uh, to get into that. So, what you can do is you can optimize the cracking procedure leveraging high performance hardware with parallel processing and all that you do that and then within 5 hours you will get to the root password. So, it is some effort, but it is really worth it. So, it is only 5 hours you can see you put 5, 5 and half hours you get to the root password. Now, you can start the attacks you can perform network based attacks you can do remote attacks and all that. Simplest is to, to see what are the uh, to use uh, scan the ports of the smart device to see if it is listening or transmitting on any one of them. And then you know that uh, you can then perform uh, you, you so you will have since you have access to the root shell you can analyze and you can do man in the middle uh, man in the middle attack right and uh, um, you can then uh, you start uh, packet sniffing program to see what kind of traffic is actually flowing and then you know that it is using from uh, so, it is uh, essentially using a, a sort of a HTTP connection to get firmware updates and that uses plain text HTTP. So, that part was also easily traceable ok. So, any firmware update uses HTTP and it uses simple plain text. Uh, so, if you know that much why not go and get the update ourselves right you can since you all know that. So, you can get the update yourself and put it there. So, this is one form of attack uh, that you have bypassed the complete system and you are able to get it yourself. Then you come to know from binary analysis that it uses MQTT which uses publish subscribe there are brokers there are publishers and there are subscribers perhaps the nodes the sensor nodes are uh, publishing uh, their data and this gateway device is subscribing to it. 
it is more like a broker and come also as a subscriber. So, it has access to all that data right. So, the since it is a broker it can also have access it can also do uh, it can also act as a publisher right sending uh, sensor information back to the manufacturers uh, server it can also do that. Um, so, you can now that you can actually do a firmware update uh, the device will fetch the package using information gathered over MQTT and the device will run some MD5 checksum on the package compared with the hash and all that. If the hash matches the device will go through with the update the hashes do not match the device will reboot and the and start the entire process again the whole verification mechanism is still under investigation for possible security vulnerabilities right. So, this is what you could uh, do further damage. High level you can since this is collecting data from several sensors which are giving you information on uh, energy data you can play havoc on the energy data on that part and you can also modify the device ID right and um, you know where it is being stored you know that it is in the E squared prom and uh, you can go and uh, analyze the E squared prom dump you will be able to get the ID and you can change the ID. So, all of this means that uh, using this modified ID um, you can demonstrate that a smart reader will pick up the wrong ID from a modified device there is nothing you can do because you have modified it and you can manipulate all of that. So, what is the way that is the question really. One is uh, you should actually block UART completely you should never allow because the whole root of the problem started because you had UART access. So, that is the first step towards uh, ensuring that you do not allow UART to be restricted access to UART and uh, once you do that all this boot parameter modifications can be avoided. Then you can also use better hashing algorithms for passwords then uh, you can encrypt the file system that is sitting on the uh, embedded uh, device this uh, gateway device. So, the attacker ca could be able to intercept the device in transport and directly modify the contents of the NAND flash. So, if you could encrypt it that is also good. So, all of this means um, you will have to ensure that um, the system the devices whose architecture is self contained that is microcontroller based system it becomes necessary to secure all update channels. Do not do all this uh, plain text uh, updating and all that so you should avoid doing them. So, you can see that this paper essentially spoke about a step by step way by which one can do um, you know get into the device you can essentially you can open you can install and you can close and therefore, you can tamper the device and there are simple ways by which you can avoid doing that. So, in summary all of this uh, means that um, this area is open and rich in problems um, and I will explain to you what you can do with all these signatures which are available scattered around an embedded device.